sitting on the set, having the Heisman Trophy in front of me. I didn't even, after a while, I didn't, I just sort of lost myself in that moment. I didn't even hear anybody around me or even think about where I was. I just started to draw that Heisman Trophy, and it was amazing. I think it meant a lot to not just being an artist, but sort of the 15 year old running back who had these dreams of moving on. I don't know if I ever would have been pro. I mean, it was really fast and everything, but, but those dreams that a 15 year old boy has about what it's like to be the best, it's intense. It was profound. Chances are good that you or someone you know enter the Church of College Football each Saturday of late summer and autumn. Perhaps football of the professional variety is more appealing, but no matter where gridiron genuflecting takes place, anyone who knows football is well aware of the Heisman Memorial Trophy. Baylor quarterback Robert Griffin III took home the 77th Heisman on December 10th and talked about how we're all amazed when great things happen, but they don't happen without hard work. Amherst College resident artist David Gloman knows firsthand the power of these words, as he was selected to personify the artist behind a Heisman portrait. Before 9-11, an official portrait was part and parcel of earning the 45-pound bronze. However, the downtown athletic club, which originally commissioned the piece in the 1930s, never reopened after that fateful September morning. Fast forward just over 10 years, and the portraits no longer reside on club walls. They are stored in upstate New York and reside in a sort of athletic and artistic purgatory. Noting Griffin's accomplishments and hard work, it is important to also point out David Gloman's contribution to both art and football, as he helped put the revered and lasting Heisman portrait back in the proverbial limelight. The artist was hired to produce close to 30 pencil sketches of Heisman finalists, as well as the Heisman Trophy itself. During a long four-hour shoot in New York City, ESPN took somewhat of a retrospective look at what a Heisman portrait means, and not just for the players. Some of Gloman's thoughts can be heard in what writers, producers, and editors painted as a sort of artistic internal dialogue. Under a single, hanging light, Gloman sat on a stool atop a studio set's timber floor. In front of him, a wooden easel speckled with paint from works past. To his right, a production team of close to 20 people. Three screens occupied the remaining 270 degrees of wall space on which more than 75 years of college football greatness was projected and, within an arm's distance to his left, rested the Heisman Trophy. Well, they, they told me the premise of the shoot, that it was an artist in the studio drawing the Heisman, and what was going through my mind as I was dry, drawing the Heisman, um, how the rich history of the Heisman had to be portrayed in the drawing. The candidates, um, obviously, how they fit into this, uh, the story of the Heisman. Um, you know, even as I was drawing them, I was wondering, what are they thinking about going into this? What do they think about the Heisman? So as I drew each candidate, just I don't know if I, I, I was consciously trying to draw that, but I think that was in my mind. How do they fit into this whole presentation as well? Each single one of them, what they bring to it. How do I capture that? Gloman doesn't know why or how he was chosen, only that the event was one of his greatest professional experiences. They must have seen something in the work that matched their sort of visual idea of what they needed. The drawings are very realistic. They're very kind of tight in a way. They're, act they're gestural. I mean, you can see the action in the poses. and I think that probably attracted them to the drawing. While the sketched Heisman was made from a replica, it represented everything he dreamed about as a young football player, and the opportunity to be part of such an iconic event through his work was a significant honor. The esteemed role, regardless of the decision processes involved, was not just blindly given to him. So while he had to submit work in the selection process, earning such a spot took years of brushstrokes, patience, knowing where to go, and what to look for in subject searches. It's about experience. It's about being as present as you can in the moment. 
you know, an athlete's kind of the same way. He has to be aware of his surroundings and react to things that are happening in, you know, moments notice around around him, and it's instinctual. An athlete and an artist, because the landscape changes constantly. The light's changing. A tree is falling. Somebody's built something somewhere. I'll forget a color. There's all these different levels of change and reaction to this. Gorman is long known for his work along the Connecticut River, most of which is within a mile or so from his Hatfield studio. So it goes without saying that figure drawing is but one page in his book of artistic talents. Under a powder blue sky, Gorman recalls his aqueous allure while walking through a tree-lined floodplain of saturated earth bordering harvested tobacco fields. When I was a kid, I, I was attracted to water because um, you know, I could float stuff in it. You know, I could throw something in it and watch it sink to the bottom. And then I started to try to control it, the way it flowed. So it's like sitting on a curb when I was a little boy and watching the water flow as it, after a rainstorm and trying to uh, divert its flow or build a dam or um, change it somehow. The area I'm particularly painting in Hatfield was settled in the early 17th century. So there's this rich history which draws me to the, the river. I was out painting one day and this woman came up to me and she said, oh, you know what this place was? And I said, no. And she goes, it was one of the largest Native American encampments in the area, right at the first floodplain of the river. You know, there's something about this place that's really special. I mean, this used to be a huge lake. And this is the last thing that's sort of left of this lake is this river. It's been, it's ancient. So there's a sense of that in, on the banks of the river, which I'm really drawn to. It's very primal. So I have these spots I kind of go to, you know, I have my top to five spots that kind of go back to and revisit. Occasionally I'll wander off and try some new areas, which I think is important. But I could almost see myself just being here the rest of my life. It's enough to sustain me. David's journey to living out his dreams began long ago and was sparked by a knee injury that tore him away from football. His grandmother, who was always one of his biggest supporters, brought him sports magazines to pass time. And like any child left to their own devices, he made the best out of a less than ideal situation. The fallen gridiron gladiator found himself producing sketches of these athletes in the magazines. By the time recovery was complete, David had begun thinking about college and making art a part of his life. His injury cleared a path and the field of play became a blank canvas. Cloman says his mother worked as a teacher and his father taught him independence. Three years ago, the journey became more concrete when Gloman was selected to move from being an adjunct professor to thriving as an Amherst College resident artist. He has now been with Amherst College for 19 years, and in the process, showed work at numerous galleries and has been featured in many news outlets. In 2005, he was awarded the prestigious Guggenheim grant. This semester, however, he went on sabbatical to focus his work. When he returns to teaching next semester, Gloman agrees that he'll have much to profess. One of my mantras has always been, and it's kind of a cliche, but it's really true, is that you just keep going, no matter what. You keep going. To quote the, the typical athletic phrase is you give 100%, 110% all the time. You don't think about that. You just do it. You lay it all on the line as much as possible. And I, I, you know, I try to do that in my life with my teaching here, my artwork, and it's really given me some amazing things. You know, it really has. It's so cliche, but it's really true. You know? I think what I do with my students, and they would probably support me on this, is that I'm very in encouraging, and I tend to build on what works to point out what doesn't work or what what needs to be changed or addressed or dealt with. I think that's important, but also to build on what does work. And it's confidence. I think anybody can draw. I really believe that anybody can draw. And I think that somewhere along the line it hasn't been nurtured. Once you start to become confident in your skills and the belief that you can do this thing, then all the other stuff I think takes care of itself. And most of the students come out of a, of a class with that belief that, you know, I can do this. You know, I understand this. I didn't think I could do it, but I could.